started a broadcast and we will have more attendees okay we just need to wait a couple more minutes until everybody's on board okay Well, um, Good morning. Since, yep. since you're waiting one more minute or so, I just want to ask you when I do this, are you able to see just my slide or are you able to see my next slide too? I see your next slide as well. Yeah, that's what I thought. Okay, no okay. worries. Okay, it's 28. We wait another three minutes and then we're going to be starting. Yep. Okay. Sounds good. Hello, Jean. <laughs> Happy Friday. <laughs> it's uh, 11.30. We're going to be waiting another minute, and then hopefully more people are going to join. We already have uh, a good number, but we had many RSVPs, so maybe the timing, you're going to need a minute or two more. And we are live streaming on um, Facebook, which is very interesting as well. Okay, good morning, everybody. It's 1131. We're going to be starting that. I think everybody these days knows how to do this webinars. I'm a master in it after doing like 50 public and maybe another 50 for my own clients only within four months. Amazing, amazing, amazing. So, uh, Pretty much today is all about selling an office. Um, I'm working today with Jean. Jean one of, uh, is, is a friend, is uh, one of uh, the consultants that I work with. Uh, pretty much we thought today specifically because it's a very, very hot topic, selling offices and doing it properly. So we wanted to provide a little bit more information to you guys. I think everybody knows the drill. Please lose, use Q&A for questions and also use chat for, you know, talking to us or, you know, talking to everybody. And uh, I don't want to waste any more time. Jean, please um, take it away. All right. Good, good morning, everyone. Thank you for attending. And as Fazel said, I too have been uh, inundated with doing uh, webinars, which has been great. Um, as of the last probably two months now, um, I've been out in the field um, every week, so on site with clients. Um, so I'll be able to share some of that with you as well once we get going here. So for starters, just want to acknowledge all of you for taking the time. Some of you are actually sellers. Some of you are, are maybe potentially buyers. So, and some of you are just in the industry and, and that's great. Um, you know, knowledge is power, as they say, the more you can learn about things, the better. So really want to go into the pros and cons of COVID and the effect on practice sales and evaluations that I'm seeing in the industry from a consultative standpoint. So um, 
with that, let's just click through here. The first thing I wanted to address, and, I, and I've been addressing this on many of my webinars, and that is um, really the stages of grief. And believe it or not, um, I'm still experiencing this in the field. So when COVID first hit, the first week, um, you know, as Fazal had mentioned, but I put together a, um, a group of masterminds in the industry. And one of the things that we did was we met every week to try to stay ahead of what was happening as best as we could to educate our clients and, you know, everyone in the industry, um, really what, what were the best approaches with this COVID. And so on every slide in the beginning, I was throwing up this slide being the stages of, of grief. And I have found that now that I've gotten back out into the field and have seen, you know, what is going on in every office with every staff, with the patients, this is still a very relevant slide. And I want to address that because I want all of us on the line to be thinking everyone you deal with, regardless if it's the dentist, if it's the staff, if it's the patients, are, are on various stages of this uh, Kubler-Ross curve. And that is that at first you begin with shock, surprise, you, you can't believe this event is happening. Then you get into disbelief where you're looking for evidence to say it isn't true. Then you get into frustration where you're saying, you know what, I need to recognize that things are going to be different. Oh my goodness. And sometimes you're angry about it, right? It's like you're trying to find the proper PPE and you're, you're confused with the PPP and all the facts that are happening in our businesses and, and it causes a sense of frustration. And so one of the things that, um, that we know is that as part of that, um, that frustration has still not gone, gone away for some people. Some people are stuck in frustration. I believe that most are out of denial, but they are very stuck in frustration, some of them. And then that leads to depression, where you have low mood, lack of energy. People were saying, you know, this is going to be over quickly, and we're seeing it's not. It's we're in for the long haul. And so then we kind of hit a stage of experiment where we're, it, you know, you're getting into your new situation, your new world with your PPE, your staff. You know, I was doing webinars where I had, because I go across the country, I was doing webinars um, and getting into practices earlier on than some areas like LA, as an example, was even open. And so I was hearing the rumblings of teams and doctors regarding, you know, the PPE and the doming and doffing and how extensive it was and what was happening with the patients coming in and the temperatures and the oximeter readings and all of that kind of played into a lot of experimenting, right? And doctors saying, you know, there's no validity to the air purification, there's no validity to this. And, and that, you know, may as well be true, but at the end of the day, sometimes, you know, they've had, they've, they have incorporated these things. The other thing is, you know, the decision needed to be made for how to work in a new situation and feeling more positive. And I think most people have adopted this and adapted to it. There are still practices that, you know, as of today, now hopefully the job market, we're going to see more people, you know, applying um, because the $600 is no longer going to be available to them on unemployment. But I will tell you that um, in the course of this COVID uh, pandemic, I have seen that, you know, in many offices, we placed ads and we're actually hiring very talented people who are either frustrated with the fact that the doctor that they work for has not made the appropriate changes or the fact that they just feel that they could be in an environment that maybe is safer. And then lastly, just for integration. And I think in all of these, if you look at the far right side of the slide, you'll see creative alignment, maximize communication. I'm gonna talk a lot about how to maximize the communication with your patients and with your staff. Um, and that we need to, you know, be positive, exhibit hope. This isn't the end of the world. This is a, a period of time that kind of is, is really, really inconvenient and, and not fun. But we have to develop the capability to deal with that. And lastly, we have to really share the knowledge. So I, I love this, and that is, you know, FUD, fear of uncertainty and doubt. 
And a lot of us live in this fun world in that you're feeling, you know, well, but what if? But what if the practice doesn't get to where it needs to be? What if the patients haven't come back to where they should be? What if the production and the collection isn't where it needs to be? And while those are, you know, realistic questions to ask yourself, um, again, some states I've, I've gone into um, actually closed down for a period of two weeks in Kansas. Um, other states, obviously, much longer, and then everything in between. But one of the things I noticed across the board is that FUD, fear of uncertainty and doubt, can actually per cause paralysis of us. In other words, we get so filled with so much angst and so much paranoia that it blinds us from what are the opportunities that are really good ahead of us. So I want to kind of go through that. I always, always have touted and, and do this with my clients and, and, you know, my family, and I try to do this myself, is I really, really believe it's all in the attitude. It's how we as a professional look at things and how we look at that vision to make it real. And so, yes, right now more than ever, your practice has to have good systems in place. And it just baffles me. It blew me away going into the practices that I have, great systems are in place, and I'd come back in and I'd say, okay, so how are we doing on unscheduled treatment? Oh, well, we stopped that treatment. We stopped that system. Okay, why did you stop it? Well, I don't know, we got back from COVID and we kind of just, it was just too much. Okay, well, do you understand that now we need to track treatment even more than ever? Um, how are we doing with the recall system? Well, you know, we're just so far behind that why should we even work on it? Well, are you sending notices to patients? Are you communicating with patients? Are you sending out postcards, letters, anything? No, we're just letting them call us. Well, that's, a, that's just a really poor attitude to have. And because there's not proper leadership with the dentist even paying attention to this, you know, I'm coming in and the dentist is like, well, I didn't know they stopped it. I didn't know they stopped it. And what ends up happening is where we could be hitting the ground without any speed bumps, we're hitting the ground with a couple of more speed bumps. Thank goodness, I've only run into that in two of my 29 clients that have really kind of said, oh, well, they, they blame COVID essentially. And I tease them and I say, well, you know, what we call that is COVID brain. And it's okay, we're just gonna hit the restart button and we're gonna get right back into the swing of things. So I think by kind of exhibiting that attitude of like, it's okay, you're allowed, I always call it a mulligan for those of you that play golf. It's like, hey, you got a mulligan, but that's it. We're not giving you any more mulligans. So the systems have to remain in place. So great systems are really important. When you're looking at purchasing a practice or selling your practice, I can't express enough how important it is for these systems to be in place because the banks that are lending, at least the ones that I've spoken to, the criteria that they're looking for is, what is the practice at what level are the practices back to in functionality and the ada and another large bank in the industry shared some industry standards and out of twenty thousand customers slash um ada members they are seeing on average that the total is 67 percent of what you were doing you're back to now, thank goodness in the practices I'm going into, I'm seeing they are, they are far greater than that. Most of them are at 100% or greater than what they were doing. And what I'm hearing from my clients is, you know, most of that we feel is that the patients have been sitting idle, they've been at home, they're either working from home or not, they're coming back to the practice and they're just saying, yeah, let's do it. Let's do that Invisalign, let's do that bridge. Um, either they have more money now or they, because they haven't been out spending it on entertainment and whatnot. So regardless, that is what some of the banks are looking at. And I think it's more important than ever that you pay particular attention to what you need to be doing. So I'm going to go into that in a little bit. Exactly what do you need to be doing to make it be better for a, a purchase and be better for a sale? So when we're talking about the days in your practice, I think it's really important to approach the day 
with how to make a difference in the day. And it's every interaction with every patient. And what I mean by that is, think of that first slide I put up. Just because you're at a point where you're feeling really great and you've resolved the, you know, the little sweep up of depression and you've gone up and you're now at the high end where you've adopted the change, it's all okay. Realize that patients coming in may be in a far different place. That's why I'm, I'm helping the clients that I'm hearing where they're saying, patients are saying, I'm gonna wait till it's over. Well, they need languaging skills to be taught to the team to help make the patient understand what are you doing differently that makes your practice a step above the rest to help them come in. Um, obviously, immunocompromised patients are, are not gonna come in. That's the best thing that they can do. But by the grace of God and thank goodness, there's been no documented case that has, uh, that has been given to a patient in a dental practice. However, as you may or may not have experienced, I have in several practices, the staff, because some of the staff is not obeying necessarily the guidelines of the CDC outside of work, they are catching COVID. Um, and coming in and sometimes, you know, passing that on to other employees. But in general, um, no, no documentation on any patient that has gotten it from a practice, which is good. The other thing is preparing for that patient's visit and making sure that the communication is really comprehensive, that you're very, very clear on how you're communicating with those patients. Um, and we're gonna go into letters and things of that nature. And then obviously teamwork and respect. So great leaders communicate with their staff. Bottom line, that's a must. Um, one of the things that I'm finding over and over, and it's gotten a little bit better now that the practices are open again, but I'm still having unclarity or not clear communication with the staff in regards to what are your expectations of their role going forward. In other words, if you are a practice that works three days a week or four days a week, you may need to increase your days. You're, you know, and I have often heard, and we'll go over this a little bit later, but I'm hearing from, from doctors and staff, well, you know, in March we were closed, so of course October is going to be slow. And I'm like, guys, you're forgetting that all your March patients, all your April patients, and most of your May patients didn't come in, doesn't mean that just because they didn't pre-appoint, you're gonna have a slow, you know, a slow month. You have to work at it. So I believe, again, that part of that communication needs to be communicated with them. Most of them are at work. Now, I do have a few practices where the hygienists have kind of dug their heels in and stuck it out for, you know, I'm waiting until July 15th or July 31st. I just don't feel comfortable when we knew for a while that it likely had to do with the $600. Um, and so, again, I think you have to look at, at your new normal and say, listen, what are we going to do as a team to accommodate? You cannot keep operating the way that you had and expect to, to facilitate change. So the other piece is you need to communicate with your patients. If you've not communicated at this point at all with your patients, I would say to you, um, shame on you, <laughs> to be honest. Um, but you, it's not too late. You get a mulligan, let's go ahead and get a letter out, an email or a letter. If you don't have everyone's email address in the computer, then yeah, you might need to print letters and get them out the old fashioned way by snail mail. But at the end of the day, it's so important that you communicate with those patients what you're doing to ease their tension, to ease their feeling of like, wow, I don't wanna go back to the dental office. It's just like name whatever. So I think in that communication, you need to be clear that you're abiding by the ADA, OSHA, CDC guidelines and your local authorities. In addition that, you know, the standards that we use are hospital grade standards. That's why there's been no claims of dental practices that have been giving COVID to patients because we know what we're doing in a crisis pandemic state. Um, and always remember to express hope and excitement to your patients. That's an important thing. 
really important thing. So as part of that communication, I'm assuming all of you on the, on the line are using the ADA patient screening form. Very, very important. Um, in addition, you know, I mean, I could share stories with you of multiple practices that have been called by the Department of Health in their city because a patient has tested positive and they traced it back to the practice. Not that they traced it back to the practice that they gave it to the, the practice gave it to the patient, but more so that the patient was aware, had gotten tested, knew that they were waiting for the test, had all the symptoms and lied to the practice. And then the Department of Public Health called to say, are you aware this patient has been tested positive? They came to your the practice the day before they got the results. And so again, things like that, you might start encountering if you haven't already. So there are um, obviously a whole plethora of guidelines that I'm not gonna go through today. That's not the purpose of this webinar. However, there are some guidelines that I think in regards to communication that would be hugely important. And for those of you that are on the line, um, at the end, I will give you a link you can email me. You are all um, going to be able to have access to my COVID-19 toolkit. Um, within there are, uh, you know, a great deal of information for you. So let me just pop into that really quick to kind of show you what I'm talking about. So within that toolkit, we've got, you know, under each folder, there's a plethora of information. Um, this is a great one right here. This is a flow chart for if there is an exposure in your practice with your staff, what is their what is your plan and what's the flow chart for the staff so they're aware. So that's another great thing to do. I'm not going to open each and every one of these, but health posters, PowerPoint presentation on sterilization. Um, the one that I do want to draw your attention to, though, is this sample letter that I'm having my clients send out as of now. And that is, and I don't know, can you all see this? Fazal, if you could just unmute and let me know if you're seeing everything okay. I can see everything fine. Okay, thank you. So this is basically saying, hey, we hope this letter finds you well. We, you know, our community has been through a lot. Infection control is always our top priority. Again you know, using this ADA, CDC, and OSHA. And then many patients have expressed concern with having dental procedures done at this time. Therefore, we have felt it important to share with you how serious we take this pandemic. You will see some changes when it is time for your next appointment. We made these changes to help protect our patients and team. All staff will be wearing masks at all time and all front desk area has plexiglass barriers to protect our patients and ourselves. Our office will communicate with you beforehand to ask some screening questions. Throughout the office, we have implemented HEPA and UV filtration in every room. When you arrive, text call the office and let us know you have arrived. We will text call when we are ready for you. We are practicing social distancing between patients. Upon entry, we ask that you hand sanitize. Then you will complete a questionnaire and we will be taking infrared temperature reading before being seated in the dental chair. Once you are seated the dental in the dental chair, you will be asked to rinse with hydrogen peroxide for one minute prior to any procedure. After your procedure, we will ask you to wash your hands before being dismissed to the front office. Our entire facility throughout our, your office um, are disinfected. After our strictest infection protocol, we use hypochlorous acid fogger to eliminate any possible bacteria or virus in the air. Um, if you request any special accommodations, we will assist you with either the first appointment in the morning or the first appointment after lunch. We will do our very best to accommodate your preferred day and time of your appointment. So again, someone that's high risk may say, yeah, I do feel okay coming in first appointment in the morning. That's great. And you use all those precautions. So within every software, you can have the software pre-populate the last hygiene visit was on and the date. We look forward to seeing you again. Happy to answer any questions you have. Um, and then there's your website. So again, I think this is a great way to communicate with your, with your patients about what's happening in the practice. Um, Excuse me, Jean. Oh, okay. Very good. You're back. Good. Yep. Yep. 
most most offices um, communicated initially. Some were really good and communicated every week for like 10 weeks. And then for whatever reason, they just stopped. And so I think it's really important that you consider doing something like this. The other thing is, if you're going to sell your practice, picture this, a buyer's coming to you and you could literally lay out the plan of what you've done, what communication you've had with your team, what communication you've had with your patients, how impressed is the lender going to be for the buyer when the buyer says, oh yeah, they've done this, this, and this, and this is where, how they're handling it. It will go over, I, ass I assure you, in very good light. So now into the transition. So the first and most important thing is in every transition, buying, selling a practice, you have to have a team of advisors. So the doctor is really the nucleus of that team. And you know, you have the practice broker, the consultant, maybe a real estate broker, an attorney, an accountant, insurance, and the banker. So all of those individuals help you to plan and make sure that this process is going, going to go smoothly. So there's many components that need to be looked at, especially during this time. I want you to be able to understand the process of a transition. I want you to understand the importance of how transition planning occurs and what needs to be done prior to you actually listing it or selling it or buying it. Understanding what the brokers and the advisors and important cash flow and the due diligence. And then a timeline of the steps in an acquisition sale. So the first thing is, you know, have you found a practice yet? So there are more and more practices coming on the market and I would suspect that that is going to even get to be much greater. And the reason being is that if you think about dentists that, um, you know, in 2008 that lost their money in the stock market, they stayed on much longer in their career to be able to build back up their retirement. Now, this pandemic has pushed some of them just over the edge. They're like, you know what? I just don't need it. I'm going to sell. And so there, it, there are practices out there. Now you do have to be cautious about what those practices look like and what they're doing. Just because someone didn't do all the communication with the staff and all the communication with the patients does not mean that it's a bad practice and you shouldn't buy it. There's so many other factors. The other thing is making sure that you've been kind of pre-approved, if you will, from the bank. Now, no bank is going to say, I'm gonna pre-approve you to buy a million dollar practice. Don't give me any financials, I don't care. Of course, they want, you know, they want to essentially see, are you solid as a buyer, number one, to be able to buy a practice? And yes, that variable is gonna come in with the cash flow of each individual practice that you look at. So what are banks looking at? Again, I had an opportunity to speak to several banks um, and CEOs at those banks, in particular with regards to the changing of financing and what has taken place. So some of those banks are looking for a 10% down, some are still okay with you know, nothing down, and some are at 25% down. Um, they are definitely looking at the historical data of the practice to see where that practice is actually, what they've done and how they've recovered. Believe it or not, I've talked to several, um, I'm working on several evaluations now, but in addition have talked to several doctors who are looking at practices where the seller has said, um, I'm not ready to come back yet, or I'm only seeing emergency patients, even now, July 31st, when most practices got back into the swing of things much earlier, there are some that are still doing emergency only. Now, the downside to that is that that particular practice is going to, I believe, have a difficult time with the bank because the bank is looking for at least some historical data that you're picking back up. They don't expect you to be at 100%, but they really are looking, well, we want to see some trend that you're beyond like just treating emergencies. So, um, if you are a doctor on the line that is still doing that, I would urge you to get an associate in there to start seeing your patients on a regular basis because your base will dwindle, there's no doubt. Um, what are some of the big banks lending criteria? Again, I kind of touched base on that. Um, there's, you know, there's a lot of banks out there. 
Um, obviously, everyone has their own criteria. My recommendation is you, is you discuss it with them specifically. Um, have you signed the LOI yet? So the LOI is the letter of intent. So where are you at with the actual amount that you are going to offer? Um, so different than an offer letter, a letter of intent is saying, I intend to buy your practice for X amount of dollars, but I need due diligence and bank approval. So if you're a buyer on the line, that's what the LOI is. If you're a seller, um, don't freak out that the buyer wants to put in an LOI first before an offer letter. It doesn't mean that they generally are going to come back and change the offer that they put in the LOI, although they could. If the bank is saying the practice is priced too high and we're not going to lend on it, um, then that, that could affect it. So um, did your attorney look at the LOI before you signed it and is, this, is the sale confidential? So how do you choose a practice um, to know if it's ideal? Um, there's two things. So I'm addressing it from both ends, right? I'm addressing it from the seller's perspective and I'm addressing it from the buyer's perspective. So if you're a seller, you best understand your weaknesses in your practice so that you can either begin to change them or you can hit it head on. If you're a buyer, weaknesses are many times opportunities. So while the seller may not recognize that the weakness is an opportunity, um, it is. Um, the other thing is having a clear vision that your staff is aware of, of what you want to do. Now, many practices obviously go to sell and they're 100%, you know, confidential, don't say a word to anyone. They don't want their staff to mass exodus or what have you. However, it is very appropriate at this time to be having conversations about you know, hey, my new vision is I need you all to work another day a week. I need you to really help me to get this recall back to where we need it to be with these patients. Um, also, you're looking at healthy re patient retention numbers. So a patient retention is the patients that are rebooking for their hygiene visit. So your patient retention number, in most practices, the goal is to get that to be 96% meaning that every patient that leaves the practice for a hygiene visit is scheduled for their next one. And um, of course, understanding the practice philosophy and I, identifying treatment planning and acceptance. So many offices that I'm doing evaluations on that are for sale, when I say, what is your treatment planning process and case acceptance, they'll say, well, we print it, we give it to the patient. And on the bottom, it says the FA, the FA being financial arrangement printed out of the software. And I say, that's not a payment option. That's just saying, here's what it is, and they're letting them walk out the door with it. So that, too, needs to be addressed and be looked after. Okay, assessing your staffing volume. So as a dentist, you know, I've had some dentists who are clients that are calling or have called earlier on and said, I'm just not going to bring back the whole staff. I'm just not busy enough. And my point was, while I understand you want to ramp up, but now we're already two months into it. You need to have full staff capacity if you're going to continue to get your recall back to where it needs and your unscheduled treatment scheduled. You have to get people doing those jobs. If you're not, you're going to sit there and pray to God that the phone rings and that's not the way you want to go into selling your practice or that's not the way you want to go into purchasing a practice. So the other big component is, you know, while a lot of people and, and I totally agreed in February and March and April, you know, even into the beginning of May, maybe put the brakes a little bit, pump the brakes on any marketing efforts. Um, I, I'm not 100% convinced that, you know, in offices that I have that are doing Facebook advertising and Instagram advertising and things of that nature, they are getting new patients in the door. So. Well, you may say, I'm not going to do any of that, or I'm going to hold on that because the community isn't ready to come back to the office. I'm here to tell you that there's plenty of offices, and I, and I get their stats every single month. I can tell you out of the 29 practices, they are getting new patients in daily, and it's not necessarily at the level that it was prior to COVID, but it's definitely creeping up, and it's because they, they just pumped the brakes as opposed to putting on the brakes and stopping altogether. Understanding your PPO plans. So really, really important more than ever to make sure that you are understanding your PPO plans. If you're a seller 
and you have not renegotiated your PPO fees in over, say, two years, I would urge you to do that and get your fees raised because that is going to also look better on a purchaser's you know, line item when they look at that. Um, and then making sure that your fees, your fee for service fees, match your demographics in your area. So by zip code. So with all of this, you know, what do you face with the sale? So one of the things that we know, if you are a buyer or a seller, you should make sure that your historical data is in good order. What do I mean by that? I mean, I am amazed. I, during COVID, I did five practice evaluations and all five closed. Um, I now am working on three practice evaluations. It shocks me when I see that the profit and loss statement does not match what they're saying the income is on the tax return. Or concurrently, you could look at the production and collection and accounts receivables and that is not matching another report within the software. So again, I would urge you to make sure that you're looking at your historical data. What is that? All those items I just listed to see how exactly, you know, are they looking clean? Do they look the correct way? I'll go over some industry standards so you can take some, um, you'll have that as well. Um, and how do you communicate with your patients and staff when the stay at home order, you know, are still in place now with some people, some states. So you need to be discussing with your staff, how are they to handle the stay at home order patients that call up and say, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna, you know, there's still a stay at home order. I'm, I'm not gonna come in until it's lifted. Now, I'm not saying you should high pressure, high sell them. Like, come on, just come in, we need you, blah, blah. No, of course not. But I do believe that that paragraph in that letter is great languaging skills for the team to be able to say, Mrs. Jones, I absolutely understand your concern and Dr. Smith is absolutely concerned as you are. However, in our practice, let me go over what exactly we're doing because we are seeing a fair amount of our patients when they come in, they're, they're simply surprised at how really comprehensive we are taking this into what level and then go into what you're actually doing. So the other thing is, um, what is happening since they are back in the office, um, post returning to the office? How are your staff and patients handling that? And that's an important thing to be able to share. I mean, I've had offices say to me over and over, it's amazing, our patients are so happy with what we're doing. They're shocked at the level of comprehensiveness we have. So I think from that perspective, you have to share those things. Um, how many of your staff returned? Are there any new hires? Um, I can tell you there's a lot of people that are looking for jobs and, and these are people with experience and some really good experience. Like I'm shocked at some of these resumes I'm looking at, someone's been in a practice 20 years, 13 years, 15 years. And when I ask, can I ask, why are you leaving? What, what's facilitated you to leave? You know, I thought about it for a while, but it, with this pandemic, it just seems like the doctor really doesn't care or the doctor really isn't taking this serious. I literally had one hygienist say to me, you know, we're doing that one thing different. I had to go out and buy my own lab coats and I bought 16 of them so I could bring them home, eight a day and wash them because no one, the doctor is not doing anything different. And so she said, I, I just feel that I know there's a better practice out there for me. And she was right, there is. So the other thing when you're looking to purchase or you're looking to sell is you should be looking at your practice with the exception of March through May and saying, has your practice had historical steady growth between 10 to 25% without a fee increase? So the best way to do this, there's, there's a couple of ways. One, you can run a report from your software like from, um, let's say, January um, of 19 to January of 20, or you know, February of 19 to February of 20, to get a good idea as to were you up, down, or sideways, and do a comparison to see. Same thing with your P&L. Run a year-over-year -year comparison in a date range. We all can explain the March, April, May. 
beyond May into June, July, August, September, that's where you, you, the, the rubber hits the road. Either you're going to start doing what you need to do in the practice, so it's going to start showing. And obviously, some patients, I get it. I'm not foolish enough to think that you're going to get every single patient back, but I am smart enough to know that you have to change what you're doing. If you're doing the same old thing, the same old way, you're going to get the same old results. So does your practice get enough new patients and what types of procedures were referred out that could be incorporated into the practice? So as a seller, while you may not do endo and you may not do perio or oral surgery and you refer that out, those could be opportunities for someone that's coming into the practice that does that or Invisalign. However, what I have found in most practices is all softwares allow you to track what you're referring out, but you don't do it. You simply tear a piece of paper, a referral pad, give it to the patient, they walk out the door. And you're not really properly tracking what's going out the door. If you were, that would be a great thing to be able to present to the bank to say, hey, I've referred out 50 patients for lower endo or 50 patients to endo and you know, 100 patients for ortho, think about that as a seller to be able to present that to the buyer who then can present that to the lender to say, this, there's a huge opportunity here, lender. So it's not always just cut and dry the numbers from a lender's perspective, but realize they're also not looking at it from like pie in the sky, fluffy in the clouds. They, their underwriters are looking at it from a number standpoint. But the more of a story you have that that works with you, I have found banks are, they're absolutely willing to hear that and, and have evidence of that. So let's look at some positives of an acquisition. One, if you are a buyer on the line, um, you have an, you're buying an established patient base, which is great. The seller has a, a, an established patient base. The other thing is many times the seller has a trained staff. Um, Sometimes they have, you know, good, most of the times, established patient relationships. Um, and they have good insurance relationships. They have increased prevention for the virus. There's um, assistance from the selling doctor. So in other words, sometimes the selling doctor says, you know what, I understand the bank's only willing to lend you 75%. I'm willing to carry a note for 25% or whatever. So the mature patient base of the seller is, is, could be a very good positive. Um, mature patient base generally have more dentistry to be done and generally have more money to spend on it. Um, and, and in addition, how, how does the practice market for new patients? They may have a really good system for that. And seller referen or referred procedures. So what are some negatives? Some negatives is you're buying someone else's practice with their philosophy. Um, there could be some patients that are lost in the transition. And again, if you're a seller on the line, I would urge you to pay attention to the fact that you're, you want to make sure those patients are coming back. Um, and there could be, you know, conflicts with the new owner and the staff if you're a buyer. The other thing is within a practice that being buyer or seller, there could be established some bad habits with the patients and the staff. So what could those bad habits be? Well, they don't really pay their accounts on time. There's a high accounts receivable. There's a high outstanding number of insurance dollars. So when you're, when you're looking at your practice, doctor, seller, you should be looking at what does that look like? How is my AR and how is my insurance outstanding? Um, number of active patients is unclear or inaccurate. So when you go to your computer and you just pull up the number of patients in the software, that's not your active patients. And we'll go through what are active patients. And the revenue could be inaccurate. Um, the other big thing that we could be, I'm seeing is long, long paid, you know, overpaid long time staff. I just had a practice that I'm doing an evaluation on in the front desk was making 79,000. Been there 30 years, 37 years. The seller, I mean, the seller is literally taking not much more than that home himself at the cost of giving it to his staff. So that is, that is usually not a good thing. Um, resentment of the new owner from the staff and outdated equipment and, and the office. So if you are thinking of selling your practice, 
You know what? A coat of paint goes a long way. Some good elbow grease with a bucket of spick and span, that, that goes so far with just getting the office looking good, cleaning good, get the floors, you know, professionally cleaned, even if they're acrylic or they're, you know, um, tile or it's carpet. Make sure you get everything looking good. Okay. So how do you know that you're ready for um, an acquisition? So one of the things is, is that <clears throat> I will answer the Q&As at the end of my session, if that's okay. Um, when we're looking at active patients, um, sometimes the seller will say, I really want to stay on. And while that sounds really great in, in theory, <clears throat> you have to have enough patience to support a seller to stay on at the same time as the buyer coming in. Now, I'm not talking about a transition where the seller, <clears throat> excuse me. Thank you. <clears throat> I'm not talking about where a seller is staying on to help with the transition. I'm referring to a seller that says, well, I kind of really want to work a day or two a week for another three years. What happens is typically enough for a seller to stay on in active patients, you need somewhere between 1,800 and 2,200 charts. So if you have somewhere between 1,500 and 1,800 active patients, that's enough for one full-time dentist. If you expect to have the seller stay on, you have to have, and I don't mean, when I say charts, I don't physically mean physical piece of paper charts in the cubbies. I mean active patients. So when we're looking at that, you have to factor in how many active patients are in the patient base for 12 months and for 18 months um, and 24 months. Every broker, every banker, every everyone, consultant, factors in different criteria for saying an active patient. I'm not saying, I'm not trying to be braggadocious, but I'm saying I've been in dentistry for 38 years. I can tell you logically why I say one 12 month period is what makes sense for an active patient. And this is why. If you owned an ice cream store, a shoe store, a, you know, a, a gardening center, you're going to get your return business based on customers coming back and your new customers. In a dental practice, it's very simple. Our active patients are anyone that is coming in from today's date out one year with a cleaning that's either been scheduled or they're due for a cleaning. So that's active patients. Patients that are today out one year with an appointment scheduled for a cleaning or they are due for a cleaning. So while you may think I have 3,500 patients in my computer, they're not coming back to have their cleanings twice a year. They're not active. So when we look at hygiene, we're looking, you know, okay, assuming that you have a hygienist and she's working, you know, seeing patients 60 minutes and those are twice a year and maybe for a child 30 minutes. So 120 minutes for per year or two hours of time that the hygienist spends with that patient. So realistically, if you're looking at a practice and you're saying, okay, um, they say they have two hygienists. If you look down on the bottom of my screen, you'll see if they say they have eight days of hygiene and they're working 48 weeks a year, that's 3,072 hours in a year that means they likely have about 1,536 active patients. So this is kind of just a down and dirty to help you kind of see how the active patients are. So now we look at, you know, getting ready for the practice evaluation. I think of a practice evaluation, not valuation. So two different things. VAL valuation, determining the price of a practice. That is what Frizzell does. Evaluation determining all the, the information within the business operational systems of the practice that pertain to the dentistry end. That is what I do. So an, a practice evaluation, think of it like a home inspection. It's where you literally are inspecting, you're turning over every rock in the garden, 
You're looking at every piece of landscaping. You're looking at the roof. You're looking at the insulation. You're looking at the plumbing, the electrical, everything. So in a dental practice evaluation, there's lots that I look at or that you should be looking at. Or if you are a seller, there is a lot that you need to understand is going to be looked at. So doesn't it make sense that we get our house in order before we have the home inspector come? And that being that an evaluation is the what is. So it's the current, what is happening in the practice? And why would you not have, you know, you while you may connect with the seller as a buyer, you may say, oh my God, I love this seller. Like we're just, we jive together. We're really of the same philosophy. You still owe it to yourself, in my humble opinion, to make sure you look at this with a fresh set of eyes, okay? And, and so the practice data that needs to be gathered is a starting point. It doesn't mean that it's the be all end all, but it means that it's a starting point. So part of what takes place or what should take place is yes, as a seller, you want to interview that buyer. You want to know you, this is your baby. You've built it from the ground up or you acquired it and you, you grew this and you have a fondness for your patients and a fondness for your staff. And with all due respect, you need, that's your legacy that you're leaving to someone else. So of course you want to, interview that person that you're going to be, that's going to be buying the practice. Um, but you also want to be able to share with them everything that you see in the practice that's been a success and then also some opportunities that you may or may not even know exist. So when I look at a practice, I'm looking at really what is that I, I believe that a practice, if it's patient centered, that being that a patient will pay with value, they accept with value, they appoint with value, and they speak with value, meaning they invite others. So let's look at an active patient base. I kind of already explained to you how you would get the number of how many active patients. So it's what are due for recall, and I mentioned in a given period of time. Why is that number important? Well, it's important if you're a seller and you don't know what your number is, how in God's name are you possibly able to tell your hygienist how many days of hygiene you need per week, per month? The other thing, you need to know how many chairs you need to accommodate those patients, how many assistants you need, how many administrative staff, how many supplies, instruments, et cetera. So your active patient number is very important. So ideally, one of the things with being appointed ahead in hygiene is Again, I'll give, I give the practices a, a leeway between 80 to 90% of, of your patients that are walking out the door are pre-appointed. So what happens is you don't want to have a sense of you know, saturation when you really don't have saturation. So we know that when you have a full appointment book, there's less frustration. Um, there's you know, patients who really want to be there show up which is, by the way, what I'm seeing in COVID, cancellations are way down, especially if they're calling two days before. In addition, um, it's amazing to me when I'm talking with the um, patient relationship coordinator who is in charge of recall, when I say, well, how, let's go out of the computer. Let's go on and look at the, the appointment book. How far out is hygiene booked? And they're like, oh, we're really booked out. And I'm like, oh, okay, well, how far? We look. And in one office yesterday, there were 96 units of time open in the hygienist's schedule from now till the end of August. A unit of time is 10 minutes. So don't sit here and say, oh, we're really booked, we're really booked, when your whole month of September is open and your whole month of October is open. Like you're really not, you're not doing the doctor any good by saying that or by projecting that. So. And then we look at maximizing the schedule, limiting open time. So at this point, I can honestly tell you, I am not seeing practices with a tremendous amount of open time in the hygiene schedule or the doctor's schedule. Um, cancellations are just, you know, if they get a cancellation, it's two days before when they're calling. Um, and, and all of a sudden the patient says, hey, I, I'm double thinking this. I think it's a little too soon for me to come back. They're going over the languaging skills. They sometimes convert them to coming in and sometimes they say, no, you know, yeah, of course, no problem. So really, really important. Um, in regards to open time, 
we want to make sure that the schedule is utilized 90% or greater. Meaning every unit of time that you have open as a clinician and as a hygienist, that costs the practice dollars. Dollars that are going towards how are you doing pros, you know, once you've opened the door during this pandemic. So the other thing is you should know if you don't, what is your production and your schedule, your dollar time, your production per hour. So every practice is different. But if you're really producing very low numbers, even now, you need to start looking at your unscheduled treatment plan report because production becomes collections. As most of you, I'm assuming on the line as sellers, had at least a team member come in during the pandemic to post checks to maybe work on insurance and clear up your AR, your accounts receivable. Um, so you shouldn't have many AR issues right now, meaning accounts receivable and what you're being owed issues, because most of your insurances would have been cleared up. I would suspect in offices where I'm looking at their reports now, I'm finding that very few dollars are outstanding in 90 days or more for obvious reasons. So really, really important. So on the accounts receivable, um, it should be one month of production or less. In other words, if you're producing 50,000 a month, your accounts receivable, which your accounts receivable is all monies due to the business by either an insurance company or a patient. That's your total accounts receivable. When you run your accounts receivable report as a seller, depending upon what software, but almost all, you have to back out your negative balances or your credit balances. If you don't do that, your accounts receivable report will not be accurate. In other words, the total at the bottom um, will not be accurate because it's taking off the credit balances and reducing the AR. So if you need help, depending upon what software, just you know, email me, text me, whatever, to, to help you get that number and make sure you're getting the correct number. But a buyer is going to be looking to see what is your accounts receivable. If your accounts receivable is greater than one month average production, what that tells the buyer is that you likely do not, you just do a lot of dentistry and you don't necessarily have good financial arrangements in place. What that also tells the buyer is the person at the front desk is terrible at collecting cash, collecting over the counter, collecting co-pays, not cash per se, but collecting you know, over the counter. So positive cash flow is needed to meet the practice expenses, including payroll, bottom line. If you're not having positive cash flow, we know in March, April, May, some of you got PPP, some of you did not, some of you got idle, some of you did not, but it was very difficult to have positive cash flow. Some of the banks allowed you, you know, hey, you can defer the payment. Some of the student loans, you can defer the payment. But the time of reckoning is back. Banks are saying, no, 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 you got to start paying now. We gave you a break. And so you can't just sit back and hope that things are going to happen. You have to take the bull by the horns and you have to make sure you're looking at these systems if you're planning to sell your practice. You also have to look at your D0150, your ADA comprehensive exam code. That is going to help you to understand what the buyer is going to be looking at when they're looking at your practice. It represents the future growth of your practice. If your staff is not putting in the referral source, so they drove by, that's from the insurance, another patient referred them, that's going to, you know, you're still going to be able to capture that, that amount, um, but it, it's important that you really identify that. The other question that comes up in an evaluation is if you're billing D0150, which you are able to do that billing per the ADA on an existing patient or a new patient. An existing patient, you can do that every three to five years, um, depending on the insurance. On a patient of that's new to the practice, obviously you want to code that out differently in your service code so that you can identify who's an existing versus a true new. Okay, the next is uh, again, I 100%, 1000% believe in a patient-centered practice. When we know we are focused on being a patient-centered practice, 
We offer the best dentistry that we can. We create an environment where the patient believes us, likes us, trusts us. We create a relationship that can sustain change like a pandemic. We create an environment where patients can and do participate in their choices for their health. So if you've created this practice, that's great. You don't have to hard sell anyone. I'm not about selling more dentistry, but I am about making sure that the patients understand that you care about them and that we've done things that are going to make their experience better, safer, more comfortable. So this is just a timeline of what takes place if you're a buyer. I'll happily, you know, we can go over that privately. Um, for a seller, I've gone over what you need to be paying attention to. Now, when we look at the, um, the hope isn't a strategy. Um, there's some action plans that I would urge you to do. The one thing is I would urge you to make sure that you're really getting an action plan together if you're a seller about who's accountable for what and what action item are they gonna do regarding your business operational systems. Recall, accounts receivable, collections, unscheduled treatment. Um, if you don't believe me in regards to what opportunities are in your practice, just run a report of unscheduled treatment from January to July 31st. You will be shocked. Um, the other thing is by changing some of these behaviors and putting action plans in place for your team, you don't have to say, hey, I'm selling the practice. You have to say, hey, we need to step it up a bit. I can't continue to operate in this manner. We have to change our behaviors. We have to change our communications so that we get ideal patient care. So guide the patients to the appointment times each day that you want them to come in and practice the languaging skills. So I love this saying by Henry Ford, whether you think you can or you think you can't, you're right. It, the first step is believing in the possibilities. So understanding that you can replace negative ones with positive ones. And you have to sometimes believe it before it's true. Everyone is either a starter or a finisher. Starters need help sometimes finishing. They, they can't just get to the finish line as quickly. Finishers are sometimes procrastinators. They can't get started, but they have the endurance to finish all the way to the end. In your practice, you've got a little bit of both of them. I guarantee you. And support is needed by both types. So what the message I would say to deliver to your team is, guys, I need us to be self-starters. I need us to be going and doing what we need to do. This is the COVID toolkit. Um, it will be on my website under resources. You can take a picture of this. Um, so it's my website and then resources. I will happily offer anyone till the end of August any complimentary consultations. Just let me know what, what you and when. Just email me. My email is there. Again, you can take a picture of this with your phone. These um, slides are going to be, I believe, on my YouTube channel as well. And then any final thoughts, any questions at this point? I don't see anything in the q and I do not see anything in the chat. So I think unless anyone has a, another a question, I can go ahead and turn it over to Fazal. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jean. Absolutely. That was, Thank you. That was excellent. So thank let's you. go lunch and I don't need to speak. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you very much. We just spent about an hour. I think um, I'm going to be able to speak another 30 minutes to 45 minutes. So pretty much what I do is a little bit different than what uh, Jean does. Uh, I'm going to be I'm going to be trying to be respectful to everybody's time and pretty much make sure that we can finish as soon as possible. This is going to be recorded. So in case you're leaving, just know that you're going to receive an email with the complete, uh, uh, complete information. Okay, so pretty much uh, let me start my presentation uh, about me. Uh, well, I've earned my master's degree in business taxation. Also, I have a graduate certificate in financial planning. I'm a CPA. Uh, I have a couple other designations at as, as, a, as a forensic accountant. Uh, I did go to law school. I have training as uh, for business valuation and uh, financial analysis. I started this firm actually in 2008, but I've been doing pretty much helping people for 25 years. Uh, I'm involved in transitions a lot in different kinds of uh, you know capacities. 
startups, uh, practice sales. I'm not a broker. I'm going to tell you guys what I do. Uh, acquisitions, valuation specifically, and due diligence. Uh, also, we are pretty straightforward dental CPA firm. We just do taxes, accounting, consulting, and business uh, 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 business consulting. We don't accept any commissions, no kickbacks, no referral fees. And also we look for our best clients only and we try to have no conflicts of interest. Good. Um, why are we here today? So pretty much because I want, I mean, Jean and I, uh, me differently, her differently. We want to pr try to provide uh, a lot of um, information to you so you guys know uh, what's going to expect you because uh, as uh, the more familiar you are, uh, the, the easier this transaction is, is the, or this process is going to be. This is no lecture in accounting, valuation, tax, legal, whatever. And uh, you do need to consult your own advisors. Uh, and we're just uh, uh, discussing some direction and pointing out uh, some direction so you know uh, what needs to be done. Also, we try a lot of the stuff that we talk about. These are mistakes that everybody can easily avoid because at the end of the day, um, you know, avoidable mistakes can be very costly. Also in a transaction, no matter if it's buying or selling, there is a lot of anxiety. So you know what is, if, if you know what is expecting you, if you know how it's done, so pretty much I would say piece of cake. Um, I am discussing these issues on a daily basis with my clients, buyers, sellers, brokers, lenders, and that today I'm gonna provide you with an update about my all of the uh, uh, conversations and you know, observations, especially in the past three, four, five, six months. Before that, you know, that, that was a different story. Also, I'm a realist, I'm a scientist, everything that I base is on numbers, but still, it's my opinion, my observation. Uh, the most important takeaway that sellers should have today is pretty much, it's, uh, you know, not easy, uh, but it's important to retain and transfer goodwill of the practices. So not just let go, not just you know, uh, do as it used to be. We need to be proactive before we do uh, selling. I don't know if you, some of you have seen any of my webinars for buyers. So I'm very, very, very biased, biased toward buyers when I, when I talk about buyers. But today I'm gonna be sp specifically talk about sellers and there's a difference and uh, you're, gonna, you're gonna see the differences. Uh, also, I'm a business CPA, I'm involved in dentistry. My wife is a dentist, my brother, my mother-in-law, the majority of my uh, clients. And um, I don't recommend anyone to, you know, right now concentrate specifically on selling, except you have to. And in uh, a good day, in a real process, and, and that, that's, that takes you you're like three years. So a lot of the stuff that Jean mentioned, a lot of the stuff that I usually speak about to sellers, it takes years to, you know, clean it up and make sure that you're ready to sell. Uh, also, I've been, you know, a consultant for over 25 years, financial consultant. So I've survived, you know, the, the failing of the economy, 2008, 2020 now. And uh, also just know that uh, if, even if I sometimes work for a buyer, if I find valuable practices, I always uh, recommend the buyers to overpay for the practices. Um, and uh, again, today, one more time, uh, I believe no matter what happens with pandemic, with whatever, whatever, you know, I've seen dentistry through my brother for at least 30 years. I can tell you uh, dentistry is not going to no, we're not going to go anywhere. We might have some, you know, issues, short term closures, first wave, second wave, third wave, but doesn't matter because it's going to come back. But it's always important to have the right fundamentals, business fundamentals in your business and retain the goodwill and always, always, always plan well ahead. So some of the questions has COVID-19 impacted practice sales. We're going to respond to all of that valuation. Uh, how, what, what's going on with sellers? What's going on with um, with lenders and how do we finish? How do we close? And again, I want to keep go back to this uh, point or take away in my, of mine. We are here to learn a little bit how to how to retain the goodwill of the practices, and as a seller, again, sell at the highest and best possible price. We're going to talk about price and value a little bit later. We're going to be talking about how it's priced for the buyer, for the seller. It's different. Uh, and we're gonna talk about all of this stuff. Okay, so what's the transition process? And this is from the point of view of a seller today. Uh, 
So first of all, Sele has to prepare how uh, I'm going to explain some of that Gene already explained. Then very important as a seller, do you want to sell with a broker or do you want to sell it yourself? And uh, also that's, that's not a problem to sell with a broker, but please take the right broker. We have two kinds of brokers. If you just want to say good and bad. So we have the good ones, we have the bad ones. So it's very important that you know who do you work with. Also after pretty much you, if it's you or it's the broker, it's important that the, that the practice is marketed, uh, advertised sufficiently and, and well, and uh, it's important to find the right buyer. Who's the right buyer? I'm going to explain it to you later. Then obviously there is an offer. So, uh, and also know as a seller that the offeror, the buyer is the master of his offer. So um, usually a lot of intent is pretty straightforward, not very difficult. I'm going to explain what that is uh, as, as well, but just, just know that this, that the buyer initiates the, uh, um, the process. So pretty much uh, that's, that's, that's the first step. And then uh, once the letter of intent is, com uh, is accepted, we have to complete some contingencies, both sides. And once the contingencies are satisfied, we talk about the uh, talk about lease, we talk about the uh, other contracts, then we sign the documents. Before that, we have some pre-closing obligations, then we have the closing, post-closing obligations, redo accounts receivable, completion of the work and covenants. And these days, very important, due diligence. So why due diligence? Because uh, pretty much uh, there is double work now. So we have to do some historical due diligence. We have to do some uh, COVID-19 due diligence and see what's going on today. And I'm going to say uh, what, what the importance uh, of all of that is. So let's see where the market was when COVID hit and pretty much what was happening after that. Well, it's everybody's saying it was a seller's market. Uh, I slightly disagree with that. I think it's always mostly 80, 90% buyer's market because buyers have the money and they have the contingencies, but uh, that's fine. So pretty much good practices, you know, they have five, 10, 15 um, offers sometimes. And we have about a uh, thousand to 1500 transactions a year, but we have six, 7,000 of graduates each year. So there is always a shortage, but that's why there's always a good, uh, a uh, good uh, decision to make a startup. So, um, so what, what is going on now? Is it going to be a buyer's market? Well, we don't know. So obviously there are some of uh, the buyers, some of the sellers are walking away. And uh, also uh, the, some of the buyers want to buy right away because, uh, well, because of fear, because of uh, they don't know what's happening right now. I apologize. I have a new computer and I have to get used to that a little bit. Okay. Um, also, some of the sellers might, uh, you know, not sell and stay for another one, two, three, four, five years because of uh, pretty much what's going on with uh, the 401 case. Um, also, it's uh, usually uh, what I usually, you know, try to advise is that buying and selling is a long term decision. So even if you're a seller, uh, because of COVID, I think it's not going to be easier. It's going to be a more long-term issue and same for the buyers. So buyers need to understand pretty much what the consequences are going to be if they buy. Uh, and usually a transition is a shock already to the office and now add what's going on with uh, COVID. Also, we don't know really what's going to happen with the practice sales because we just had the first wave. Uh, we're going to have the we're going to have the second wave and also we don't have much historical data to, to be able to clearly uh, tell you what's going on. So the main uh, point pretty much is, uh, you know, depending on how sellers or practice owners react these days, they can re either retain the goodwill of the practices or some of the practices the the, the, the price can go to zero or the VAT not the value of the price, because pretty much there is no more action, there is no more cash flow. And how all of that works, we talk about that a little bit later. Okay, what happened in March, April, May, because we had the shutdown. Uh, I could tell you that I was working on 2025 active transitions, it went back to five. Uh, and uh, I can tell you that I recommended to my sellers uh, to slow down, to concentrate on the pres preservation of the goodwills and pretty much not you know, continue some of the sales if, uh, if it didn't work out for them. Also with my buyers, I told them to pretty much go case by case and, you know, uh, write, uh, look for the right fundamentals. Now in the past three months, again, last two months and this month, this month, everything is a little bit easier. So this month, I mean, uh, August, 
Uh, some of the practices are back to 100%, so pretty much banks or uh, funding, um, um, but still we have some limited financing for startups, especially because one of the larger banks right away said that they're not really funding uh, some of the startups anymore, so limited financing. We have limited financing for acquisitions. I have not seen except for one full financing for the majority of the deals also the transitions take time usually we uh, would uh, close 45 days to nine to 60 now i've seen 90 days or longer uh, there are also some more practices in the market uh, but not very good practices a lot of it some of the sellers are really honestly and literally are walking away from the practices they just let it go don't pay rent uh, very, very weird. Um, also, I can tell you that I've, that I've seen very, very unique and weird deals. So I have some of them here. So the practice I would value at 500,000 was sold for 100, one was valued for 250, was sold for 80,000. I've seen a short sale and I had, I had not seen that since 2008. Uh, some walked away and also the majority of the practices that sold, they had some C19, COVID-19 discount. Uh, so pretty much um, the first question before you ever consider to sell is, well, can you sell? Is it the right timing? Well, can you sell financially? Do you have enough money? Um, okay, uh, let's say it is a rule of thumb, you know, plus minus one, two, three percent. You need about, um, when you have, when you compute your, your, uh, uh, your expenses, uh, just compute like between four and seven percent of your total net worth uh, to uh, as your annual expenses. And if let's say you have two million dollars and uh, your expenses are like like one hundred fifty, one hundred twenty-five thousand, uh, so this pretty much would be a number if you can realize that number. So that would be okay. You would be able to uh, to to retire. And I'm talking about some liquid and investable assets. I'm not talking about your house. I'm not talking about your car. So for the best source for that is actually your financial planner. So physically, some of the doctors, they just sell too late and then pretty much they have a nice cash flow in practice and then it goes down because of injury production. So the price might even go, I don't want to say it, but even sometimes to zero. Mentally, so do you, can you sell mentally? What are you going to be doing? I can tell you what my, my, what my dad did. He was working, I don't know, 40 years and then he retired and then he didn't do anything else and then he... Uh, was that really happy with his retirement? So I think he retired too early and I do see that uh, some of my clients. I can tell you I won't ever retire because I love what I do. Uh, also these days you have to be very careful with predatory buyers. You have to be very careful with predatory brokers and consultants. Uh, and it's very important for you to know that, you know, some of the people believe it, just because it's COVID, they can just, you know, uh, lowball and that's, that's, that's incorrect. Um, and also very, very important for everyone to know that, uh, okay, uh, as a seller, do not sell too late. I'm going to explain what's going to happen if you sell too late in numbers later. And also do not sell for the wrong reasons. Good. Um, now, the question was, first of all, a couple of slides ago, do you want to sell? If you want to sell, sell with the right broker. So who is the right broker? Because there are many bad apples. So I cannot name them for you, but it's important that you educate it, that you get educated about a process, that you say, that you go see, check their websites, check their available you know, listings, see if uh, the listings that they have fits the, you know, the profile of your office, ask for second opinion. So, uh, and especially ask people that don't charge commission or don't live from commissions and these people are pretty much a cpa and attorney the reason for that is you know cpa attorney doesn't care for how much something is going to get sold because we charge fees it means per hour per project uh and that's important so and and also by law a cpa attorney is obligated to pretty much look for your best interest also if you have a broker make sure that he she does not overprice it because if the practice is overpriced and it doesn't sell within three, four months, then pretty much you have a big problem. And the reason for that is uh, um, it's, it's, uh, it's difficult to sell it. So everything was not right. It was not 
advertised correctly. Also, just know what a broker is doing for you. So is he doing some showings in person, for instance? What else is he doing for you? Very important that you get proper service for like 10% if, if you pay them brokerage fee. <clears throat> and also you want to know how all of this, how your practice is advertised. Is he just putting it on his website and just waiting for phone calls? Well, pretty much that's what some of the brokers do and that's incorrect. Some others do great, great, great job. Uh, one more time, there are some really predatory consultants, brokers, they don't even have a license. They're trying to, you know, steal, you know, convince sellers that they can do a better job and pretty much uh, they hurt the sellers, they hurt the buyers, they hurt the practice, they hurt the employees, I think they hurt, uh, you know, the patients. So it's important that you do due diligence and uh, you select the right broker. Um, also, I want to make sure that you guys read the, um, you know, the, the, the letters, the, 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 the offers that they provide to buyers sometimes and make sure pretty much that that's, you know, legit. Uh, I mean, in, consult uh, some, uh, you know, uh, maybe a CPA your attorney, somebody who can really help you and, uh, you know, have a uh, second, uh, uh, second uh, view. And, uh, some of the bad apples, some of the bad brokers are looking only for themselves. You know, some of them I've seen not even submitting the, 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 the offers to the, to the seller because they think that's not the right uh, uh, offer because they don't profit properly. So, and the, a lot of these people, a lot of the bad apples, they're primarily looking for their own interest. So they're not looking for the seller, even if they're supposed to present, uh, represent the seller. So there is one broker who wants to sell the office, who wants to sell buyer alone and also renegotiate the lease. So triple dip, so to say. And that's how pretty much a lot of these people function. So you want to make sure that you, that you work with the right uh, broker and also that your practice is not oversold. Okay, then uh, maybe you want to decide to buy, to sell your practice uh, yourself. So how do you find a buyer? Well, pretty much your network. And that's like 50% of the practices that I help. Buyers, seller, they, they, they found themselves somehow. So how network, local CDA, uh, their CDA websites and publications that you can put your ad, dental town, dental trader, dental shopper, Facebook groups, events, and uh, yeah, maybe you have a practice, you can email me and maybe I have the right buyer for you and uh, I just connect you. So again, one more time, I'm not a salesperson, I don't get commissions and uh, stuff like that. Okay, uh, Jean talked about um, the support team. So she named almost everybody. I just wanna add the equipment rep and the IT guy, very, very important, but uh, she pretty much talked about everybody else. I want to talk about dental CPA, who that is. Well, somebody like me, what is he providing? Well, somebody like me knows the business and knows the industry. Again, that's why dental CPA. So 70%, 80% of my clients are dental. That's why I know what's going on in the business, you know, and also in the industry. Um, again, one more time for sale by owner. Uh, <clears throat> for sure, you need a CPA and attorney. So you do need consultants for fee, it doesn't mean that you just can do it by yourself. Uh, you can save 10% commission, sure. Uh, don't do it just by yourself, by yourself, because you, because you can uh, for sure, uh, uh, you know, accumulate some liability. It's very important that it's by the book and that's something that, that a good attorney, that a good CPA can provide to you. It's important to have a non-disclosure agreement. It's important that you have the right package for the buyer, that you know the process, that you know what to, what to provide. And also it's uh, very important that you review your lease before with your attorney or a healthcare real estate broker. Also very important, uh, if you really wanna sell you know, by yourself, no broker, no problem, but also you would need a practice consultant to clean up your accounts receivable, your, your, um, your credit balances. And very important is that you pretty much uh, you know, uh, just know the process, know the steps, know the contingencies, and everything, because every, this is a step-by-step -step process, and usually the broker takes care of, you know, keeping everybody uh, in the timeline to make sure that, that we close. Otherwise, uh, we won't close. Okay, so very, very important for you to know is pretty much that the practice value can decrease. So it could this month be, you know, highest and best use, meaning producing cash flow, 
in six months, if it doesn't produce any cash flow, it can go down because you know that's something that it doesn't matter. A practice that has no client, uh, no patients, no cash flow, uh, it's gonna be it's gonna be sold at the lowest uh, that price. Again, the difference between price and value is uh, is different. Uh, and then maybe if um, some of the people that sell too late that they cannot produce anymore. Um, as a matter of fact, I'm buying a practice like this that 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 was for for one of my clients that was producing eight hundred thousand dollars, three hundred fifty thousand dollars in net income. Now it produces three hundred thousand dollars within four years and has zero income. So pretty much from you know costing like they could have sold it three years ago for seven hundred thousand dollars and right now. Well, almost zero, maybe some equipment. So it's very important for you to know. So how the price of a practice can change from highest and best use cash flowing to zero, which, um, which or, or just with the price for the equipment if it doesn't produce cash flow. Okay, so who is a good, good buyer? So we wanna make sure if we receive an offer, we also wanna vet the buyer. It's not that we just accept uh, any, any offer. So sometimes we just, I can tell you, there are some serial buyers. There's some people that are not serious. You don't want to waste your time with somebody for three months, two months. That is not, you know, serious and not vetted and not somebody who I would, you know, uh, want to be stuck with in a letter of intent because usually at the end of the day, um, um, you have a contract with them. So number one, I want to know. Uh, when they graduated, what skills they have, what experience they have. I want to make sure that they have a good credit. So usual conversation, but sometimes we also ask them to provide this information to us. We want to make sure that how much the student loans are there, if they're on top of it. Uh, we go, sometimes we do ask for liquidity. We do ask for personal financial statement. We want to make sure that they have no revolving debt, no judgment. We just ask them. This is just a conversation. Uh, how much time after graduation, if they're able to produce, if they can, let's say I'm a, you know, if I want to sell my CPA firm to somebody, so I'm not going to sell it to anyone. I'm going to sell it to somebody in dental industry because pretty much um, he, she would be able to match my, my, my experience and my performance. Same for dentistry. So do their experience fit the, the practice? Uh, do they have the budget? Uh, so at the end of the day, sometimes we do ask for financial statements and tax returns before we accept the letter of intent. Very important. And a lot of that is not done by the book, by the brokers, because at the end of the day, so they just, uh, you know, uh, don't have sometimes a lot of um, offers. But if we have valuable practices, we do that. Just uh, for you guys to know what... Um, <clears throat> what uh, um, so how the how some of the buyers have been impacted by COVID a lot of the buyers um, current buyers they lost the job because they had they had been furloughed some of them have a little bit less liquidity uh, a lot of them are very frustrated because of lack of control and really want to buy an office some just uh, don't know what to do or just waiting reconsidering plan so there are some very very good buyers out there that are really ready if they find the right practice. So if you are able to, you know, uh, clean up the practice, um, you will have some of the good buyers there. Um, good. So what do we sometimes want to review sometimes with our very good practices? So we want to take a look at their CV at a minimum. So we want to make sure that pretty much they can do, uh, they can have, uh, uh, they can buy our office. Um, also, sellers can get ready before, and I'm, and I'm telling you, this is a very long-term process. So it's not just happening. So getting ready takes time. So you have to clean up the credit uh, balances. You have to clean up the accounts receivable. You do need certain consultants. Uh, we're going to talk about lease a little bit later. Um, and this is even before you involve a broker or decide to go on your own. Uh, also very important for everybody, every practice that they have evaluation once a year. Unfortunately, once a year, once a month, I work with somebody who just passed away with a family. The reason for that is uh, the person passed away, the, the, the office is still active, they don't know anything, they don't have the documents, CPA doesn't know anything, and I can tell you 60, 70% of the of the uh, dentists are not correctly advised because they just work with some people that don't know dentists. And then they approach us and then we have to help them. We have to do the valuation for estate taxes. We have to do that for 
uh, for inheritances, we have to do that for IRS and sometimes for sale. But it's very important that everybody, you know, does some kind of valuation once a year. Very important. Uh, then get your 1099s from insurance companies together. Very, very important. Oh, excuse me. Uh, it's very important that pretty much nev no, nobody never, uh, you don't sell too late because once you sell late, pretty much you won't be able to realize uh, the, the right amount uh, of that you, what you could have realized a few days ago. Also, the last six months have shown how important good paperwork is. So we have seen it by PPP. We see it every time we go through a practice uh, um, transition. Okay. Let's talk about valuation a little bit. So valuation is price, money. It has nothing to do with value. So uh, valuation has and only something to do with, uh, with the price. It's, uh, it's a range. So Gene was talking about e-valuation. That actually takes care more of the value. It just is a little bit more intangible. What I do is a little bit more tangible. So it just depends what we are valuing. How do we put a price on something? For instance, uh, before we do something, we want to make sure what we receive so, or what we sell. So in a leasehold, we have some build out, some equipment, some lease. That's pretty much the, the assembly. That's the assemblage, how, the, how we put a price on it. Then there is some modified startup. So there are some cash flow. There are some patients. Then we have the startup. So everything is new. The partner buy in you know, is a little bit cheaper than a total acquisition. It's based on cash flow acquisition is based on cash flow how this is done I, I explain a little bit later and also expansion could be any of that so every time we want to put a price on something we want to know what we are receiving and what we are selling there are some so pretty much if we want to sell cash flow if that's a cash flow in practice and i'm going to talk about how to compute cash flow what is cash flow later so usually we have two main uh, uh approaches either percentage of gross receipt or collection, 80% of last year's collection, for instance, 70%, uh, or the a multiplier of net income or adjusted net income. So what is net income last year to practice? What is adjusted net income? I'm gonna explain data as well. Did $100,000, so the price of the practice is 200,000 if we just do a multiplier of two or less or more, depending on the range, depending on premiums and discounts. And premiums and discounts, Every time we see something good, so if, if we say value opportunity, so pretty much that's a premium. Everything we see something bad, it's a liability risk, so that's a discount. And it's very important for you who is valuing this practice. Is it a, uh, a broker who wants to sell the practice? Is it, a, is it somebody who benefits? How he is she, he, she benefits? What is the background? Just being a CPA is not enough. So sometimes, so you just need to know what's a training for business valuation. So accredited in business valuation, certified valuation analyst, chartered financial analyst. I have the training of all of those three. So pretty much uh, it's important that you know everything is based on science, it's based on numbers, and it's based on reality. Okay. Again, what is a practice valuation? Uh, and what are some of the methods? I explained it a little bit. This one is a little bit more technical. Uh, just know that uh, pretty much the value and the price, they're two different things. And at the end of the day, we wanna make sure that we, we keep it very simple. This is no lecture, so that's why I'm gonna forego this one. So what's going on after COVID-19 or during COVID-19? What are we doing to put a price on it this day on, on a practice? So pretty much, uh, usually, you know, uh, uh, practice valuation is a science. So how am I going to approach uh, COVID-19 valuation if I have no historical data? I don't know. Nobody knows it, but we are learning it, you know, what's going on right now. And I'm going to tell you later what happened with some of these valuations, but I can tell you that valuation is time specific. So if you have cash flow now, if you don't have it in six months, the same practice is going to be different. Um, there is pretty much no big negotiation because that's a fair market value because that's how pretty much a, a, a price is put on a price. Negotiations later happen with all of those, you know, after due diligence, after we find, uh, you know, stuff that we can add or deduct from the price. 
Uh, and also one more time, once we cash flow the practice, we apply some discounts going down or some premiums. And again, I'm talking about the science of uh, valuation, uh, but I'm, I'm gonna keep it very, very simple. And just know that again, it's based on historical data and it's based on later, uh, uh, is on due diligence and uh, based on fundamentals. Good. Uh, we need some basic information to do a practice valuation. Again, we're not talking about due diligence and evaluation. I'm gonna talk about that a little bit as well. So what we need is pretty much, we wanna make sure for how much the practice can, can be sold what now. So we need the tax returns, profit and loss statement, balance sheet, depreciation schedules, because we want to see what was going on in the past years. Uh, we want to see the production and collection reports. We want to see specifically after COVID-19, we have some due diligence. We want to know how they opened, how much uh, are they producing. And uh, we want to pull some, if there, uh, there is some practice um, uh, reports, we're going to be very happy as well. There is a standard of value. So what is the standards of value? So again, I'm sorry because this is a little bit technical, but I have no choice but to mention it uh, because I'm gonna, but I'm gonna try to do my best to explain it. So as a seller, we wanna sell at as highest and best price. And that's the fair market value. That's something that a practice gets sold these days in a fair market. In a, in, a, in, a, in a market. So there are you know, knowledgeable buyer, knowledgeable seller, uh, available financing. So pretty much we wanna find somebody who's gonna buy our practice at the highest and best price. So fair market value. As a buyer, so what we consider is pretty much the investment value. And the investment value could be more or less or equal to fair market value. Just depends how much it's worth it for the buyer. And that's pretty much the difference. And um, also, the purpose of valuation differs. Sometimes I do that for, you know, a gift and um, uh, estate uh, for, for IRS. So that's 200 pages maybe. And then sometimes I do just do that for buy and sell. It's just five pages. Sometimes we do that for, you know, divorce. Uh, I'm also a divorce financial planner. So pretty much it just depends what for we are doing it. So that's why the standard of value changes. That's why the, the price or the price, price range does change okay uh what's going on these days again we don't know much but because of the past three four five months we know a little bit more but just know we're missing two or three months of production we're missing uh, two or three months of net income we have some issues with uh with uh, financing that i'm going to be talking about a little bit later definitely every buyer is going to look at the financials and every average consultant cpa because there's also a lot of uh um, I would say um, sloppy work uh, performed out there. So everybody is going to look at, uh, at what's happening after reopening. So that's very important. So if the practice didn't reopen, didn't have any um, uh, patients in the past two, three, four, five months, no cash flow, the price is going to go down. Don't remember. Uh, please remember it's time specific. Six months ago, it was worth maybe 500,000. Today, just the price of the equipment and some charts. And uh, very, very difficult to put a price on it. So that's why it's very important that pretty much the practices that want to sell, you know, reopen properly, start producing, and pretty much make sure that they still can sell at the fair market value. Okay. Before we do, I mean, I just explained to you what documents we, we take a look at. I, I, I just want to explain one or two steps. It's not a complete valuation, but we're going to be doing some valuation here together. So what is the, before we do a valuation, we do a very straightforward assessment with profit and loss or a tax return. And the, the process that is happening is called normalization of profit and loss statement. So it's adding back every benefit that the seller actually received, but he, she was able to deduct it for tax purposes or for expenses. So these are discretionary, extraordinary, non-cash and personal expenses and benefits. Uh, I'm gonna go to the next page and, and explain some of these, but just depreciation, amortization, except expense, excessive expenses, continuing education, salary and auto. Then still we're gonna benchmark it. So pretty much every expense divided by or, or every class of expenses divided by total collection. And what buyers also do with this uh, benchmarking is they're gonna identify areas of risk and concern. We as a sellers, and please don't forget today, I'm just talking for sellers mainly. So 
we as sellers want to make sure that pretty much we have time and make sure that we we, we do the right thing on our books before we want to sell it it doesn't matter it doesn't mean that we want to cheat that that you know that we want to do something wrong no everything is legal but at the end of the day, we want to make sure that our practice is represented by the proper profit and loss and, and, uh, <clears throat> and tax returns. Sometimes I go to an office, I know this practice makes money, but I'm sorry, we cannot show it because uh, pretty much uh, the tax return and the profit and loss, they're just messed up because they're, I don't know, everything is deducted and that's incorrect. And also something that buyers want to know after doing some assessment is, Will I profit? Will I? And the banker wants to know: Does this cash flow? So everybody has a different agenda, if you want me to say it this way. Uh, some of the income, uh, some of the addbacks are, you know, here: car, depreciation, pension, owners and doctors' uh, income, uh, seminars, um, subscriptions, entertainment, interest, charitable contribution, equipment lease, excess legal and accounting fees practice management consulting fees, and also just be careful anytime there is a non-earned income of your books. So if you're a seller, you wanna make sure to point out, okay, that's my wife that I was paying, but she was not really working here, or my child, spouse, and, and that's very important. Okay, uh, okay, what is this? Okay, um, I think I spoke about that. Okay, so pretty much this is a sample profit and loss statement that I'm going to base my valuation based on this. So you see that the net income is 40,000. Then you see that all of the add backs equal to $200,000. So we see that the net income, excuse me, that the net income is 240. And the practice uh, collections, 600. Again, this is not a full valuation report. This is just to come up with some ranges to be able to talk to price the practice and also talk to the buyers and make sure that we you know, get it to financing. So these are the two main important numbers. So the 600,000 is the collection and the 240 is the net income. And putting this into a very simple spreadsheet and that's honestly very more complicated at that, but I want to make it as easy as possible. And I have done a lot of these, um, you know, webinars and sometimes, uh, you know, the, the stuff that I presented was too difficult. It's supposed to be very easy. So we have average production and collection is 600 and potential projected profits or, or, or sellers adjusted net income is 240. So we know based on multiplier that something between 1.75 and 2.25 is you know a range uh, where the net income is going to get uh, multiplied to get to a price because again fair market value because we know that's the range how practices get sold also based on percentage of collection of production we know that pretty much we can look, you know, what is, it, I mean, we know that banks provide like 80, 85% of last year's collection, but the buyer needs to buy equipment and also get, uh, have some working capital. So we know that 80-ish, 75-ish is about uh, the price for good practice that we can ask for. So I have those marked areas and we see that the lowest is 444 and the four, then the highest is 480-ish. So, and that's something that I also want to talk about and point out one more time. You don't want your broker to overprice the practice because let's say he says, okay, make 600, let's price it as 580 and see what's going to happen. No, I can tell you if I see something like that, I would tell my buyer, oh, don't even bother. That broker always overprices. So we don't, we don't want to go through that one. Don't waste your time. So we want to make sure that the practices are properly priced. These days, available financing is somewhere between 70 and 80-ish percentage of last year's collections, uh, subject to at least two or three months of fresh production after COVID-19. So we want to make sure that pretty much the practice produced uh, 40, 45,000 the last two, three months, because that's like 80% of the 50,000. And also we want to make sure that pretty much we don't price the practice over 80% or because there is, there is no money, there is no financing. Or if your practice is very, very valuable, then you have to, we talk about the options later, some hold back, some carry back or ask the buyer for, uh, for, um, some cash additionally extra. 
Now talk about cash flow. Again, all of that has a very specific, um, let me see what time it is. Okay. Um, I'm going to try to be a little bit faster. So cash flow pretty much deals with amount of the money that the buyer is going to have uh, available to pay for all the expenses, loan, and also pretty much for his own income. Let's keep it that. And why, why do we need to cash flow it? The reason for that is that these gentlemen, underwriters, uh, pretty much they are looking for a product of 1.25. And I'm going to explain how this 1.25 works. So pretty much we have a nominator. So that's a practice cash flow. And then we have a denominator. That's buyer's debt. So um, again, uh, we don't want to go through every uh, all of these expenses. Let's say that's a, that's a practice that has the cash flow of 270000 And then the total debt and living expenses service is 169 so this is the calculation that is that the that everybody is pretty much using consistently. So we see that this one cash flows well because the product is 1.38. And usually we're looking for 1.25 and above. Between 1, 1 and 1.25, there are some ex exceptions. It depends which bank, it depends what program. But uh, I mean, I've done this one a little bit too nice to show pretty much the ranges but pretty much that's how a practice cash flows. Good, every lender is different. Uh, so um, right now, these days we do every time, every, not just these days, we need lenders for the, for the transaction. I have not seen many cash deals in the past, I don't know how many years, because money is cheap. Uh, everybody is uh, lending money to dental. And uh, pretty much, uh, I can uh, pretty much tell you that if um, if there is no money, um, um, if there is no financing, there is uh, there is no transaction. So because not not many people have uh, have like a lot of cash to buy this practice is differently. Every lender is different. They have different programs. They have different structure. Sometimes I have two loans same amount different structure but you know the expenses are so different so not every lender is you know provides uh, you uh, the, the same uh, uh, um, offer so it's important to know what kind of a practice you're selling to pretty much go to the right lender and uh, also these days the majority of the uh, lenders are asking for the practices to come back at 80 percent of last year's average collection to um to um Fund the practice. Also, these days, um, practices have to uh, buyers. Uh, they're, they're 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 required to have more liquidity, and that's important. That buyers have uh, you know are, are very careful with the expenses these days as well. Uh, financing again is lower than than it used to be. The percentage, the rates are between three and four, some four point five, depending depending on credit. Banks are more conservative. And uh, also, uh, there is more limited uh, funding for startups. We still have the Life Oak, Huntington, Bank of America, a little bit lower, Wells Fargo, all of these people, uh, all of these banks, not very easy. And all of these banks are asking for more liquidity. Uh, and also, it's very important that sellers for acquisition deals do a uh, good job um, uh, after reopening. So, but how? Because sellers have so many, you know, limitations, more PPE expenses. Um, you know, a, a lot of the accounts receivable, what Gene mentioned, is collected. And a lot of people, it's like re restarting because they don't have this money cash flow. Um, financials don't look very good. So, and also uh, some of the buyers, some of the sellers are under some more pressure because in 2021, probably, it doesn't matter, Republican, Democrat, they're gonna increase the taxes. I mean, we are talking right now, three trillion, five trillion, whatever, you know, who, who is supposed to pay that? Well, tax payers. And actually you, me, because we are pretty much those people that generate um, most of the taxes for government. Um, so, and then a lot of the sellers, the 401k is decreased. Um, the, the, let, the net is less, cash flow is less. Not, not very easy these days. It doesn't matter. Um, it doesn't matter. I think somebody's saying that my audio has been cutting in and out. Please let me know if it's okay and I can continue. 
I heard you okay. fine. No, okay, no on my side. Thank you so much. Okay, let's talk about letter of intent. Again, I don't want to waste too much time of these because for sure, when you are writing a letter of intent, you need professional help. Just know basic, basic uh, terms. So price, deposit, 1%, no more than 1%. Uh, close date, due diligence, contract, lease. Uh, these are the contingencies, covenants, confidentiality, and exclusivity. Uh, also know that Again, if you're a buyer, buyer is the master of his offer. And also, I have seen some COVID-19 language in letters, letters of intent as well. And uh, something like that. So let's say, okay, you guys need to reopen, hit 80%. It depends. That's why, I mean, I don't want to tell you that that's exclusively the language. So make sure that you review that with your uh, consultants. Uh, buyer seller doesn't matter as a seller just know that usually we close within 45 days there are contingencies so this the buyer needs to make sure within specific time apply for a loan 28 days for due diligence 45 days for lease and asset purchase agreement and somebody needs to be on top of this that's why you have a broker if you decide to sell without the broker well and without consultants good luck and I see that sometimes and just it takes years. So sometimes if you do not if you do not know how to be on top of it, maybe it's better if you just, you know, get a broker and uh, so either broker and pay 10% or consultants and make sure that pretty much they explain to you what needs to be done. Specifically attorney CPA practice consultant. Due diligence. There is just know there is due diligence as a seller. Don't be, you know, um, um, you know, insulted if somebody's asking for your financial statement. If, let's say somebody like Gene shows up in your practice and wants the reports. Uh, there is, well, it goes obviously to the bank. Uh, if that's a good buyer, pretty much they make sure that they review the IT equipment. Um, for hopefully, you took care of the lease before. I'm going to explain how. Uh, so they're going to be a chart audit and. Um, uh, it's not required by law, but sometimes it's maybe not bad if you do engage an escrow company as well. And just for the buyers, just for you, just to know, okay, just know sellers sometimes spend 10% to sell an office. So it's important that buyers also, you know, spend some money, invest some money for due diligence to make sure that they're getting a good deal. Uh, limitations of operations. I don't want to talk about that today because already Jean talked about that so much. Just know there is a quantitative analysis. It's about money, numbers, financial documents. That's, that's me. So that needs to be, that's some of the documents. And there's a qualitative analysis. Again, Jean talked about it. So it's, it's inside, it's in the software. Uh, chart audit. So pretty much your charts need to be um, uh, in order. Uh, because um, the, so the buyer is going to review the chart, make sure they, they want to make sure that uh, everything is it's in order. So that needs to be cleaned up. So before a buyer takes a look, you want to take a look. It's like, you know, inviting guests. So uh, it's, it's very interesting because uh, Jean and I met today at 11. I did take a look at her office. Today she did take a look at my office. And both of us were laughing because we started to clean up. So just now we, we clean up as well. Gene, am I right? Okay, I think. Absolutely. <laughs> did you clean up? I did. <laughs> okay. okay, so now, so there's some due diligence after reopening. So primarily banks are looking for uh, production, not for collection, production. They, they want the collection for two months to hit around 80% of average monthly production, excuse me. Collection, production is supposed to be uh, at 80% of last year's average production. So that's what they want. But what, what do consultants, CPAs, you know, uh, uh, buyers do? Well, well, they do take a look at appointment book. Uh, they do take a look at, you know, so how, how far hygiene is booked. And a little bit more stuff that pretty much also we want to make sure that you're on top of it. Uh, again, uh, that's the COVID-19 due diligence that I do sometimes for my buyers. 
we are, you know, we just want to know what they, what they did within the past two, three, four months during the lock, lockdown. Was the communicate? I mean, Gene talked about all of that, so I don't need to talk about it, but it's important that the practice did the right thing uh, and that they pretty much uh, uh, retained the value. That's we want to make sure, and that's what we, uh, that we want to help you as sellers today to understand if you want to sell, retain the goodwill of your practices. How? I explained a little bit. Gene explained a little bit. Okay, there are some concerns. Primarily, employees are the largest concerns. A lot of are not uh, uh, returning to work. We have the FFCRA. I don't think that's the right time to, to explain FFCRA. We have had a, over 10 webinars about that. So we have more regulation. And a lot of people are talking about this second wave and the third wave, but it is what it is. If you're a seller, you want to make sure that before you even consider selling, you want to make sure you, you know your lease issues. The big one, recapture clause and relocation clause. And you want to make sure that this is taken care of. So I've seen recently uh, a deal with recapture clause. It means that pretty much if the seller is trying to sell, they're going to lose the business. So the, the, the practice was supposed to sell for 700000 it sold for 500,000 and 200,000 the, the landlord received to remove this uh, from the new lease. So I wanna make sure that everybody knows what's going on. Also, um, again, if you get, uh, if you write the letter of intent, just know you're selling everything except the accounts receivable, except personal items. Um, and also um, you have claims to refund and personal digital accounts but not to business digital accounts tax allocation i'm going to talk about that a little bit later and also covenants 10 years uh, excuse me five years between 10 and 15 percent uh, miles uh and that's pretty much uh, otherwise otherwise there won't be any financing um good so these are okay i don't this again maybe that's not appropriate to talk about the the contracts but tax so that's pretty much again my area as a seller, you sell tangible assets, equipment, personal, tangible personal property, something equipment, and intangible assets, good one. So as a, I apologize. So as a seller, you want more intangible assets because that's capital gain, 15%. And less, you want to sell less tangible assets. Ordinary income, 30% tax. Um, I want to keep it, but usually that's a little bit negotiable. And uh, for that, you need uh, pretty much a CPA. Also very important that you have that, that you involve a CPA before and make sure what consequences there are. But again, not any CPA. And I'm telling you, 60, 70, 80% of the dentists are not properly advertised. So uh, good. Uh, depreciation recapture. Um, Again, not very easy to explain, but if you had some um, aggressive uh, tax deductions, bonus depreciation, accelerated depreciation within the past years in excess of standard or regular depreciation, that amount is going to be added back to your gross receipt and you're going to be paying more taxes. Sometimes that's very, very substantial. And again, that's something that uneducated CPAs, not knowing the business CPAs are not familiar with. That's why, you know, I told you what we review is balance sheet and depreciation schedules. Very important. That costs a lot of money. Uh, also sales tax, very important. You wanna make sure that the practice that you sell does or does not need to file sales tax returns. Again, what is sales tax? is not just selling tangible personal property. Sometimes it's just filing for use taxes. Very important, very important. We've had a lot of audits on that. And unfortunately, a lot of people are not familiar with that. So if you buy some supplies out of state and you are not charged sales tax, you need to file use tax returns. Otherwise, you're in trouble. Why in trouble? This is trust money. Every time you deal with trust money, you're in trouble. It's like EDD money, uh, employment development, uh, I mean, uh, employment taxes or sales taxes. It's different than income taxes. 
unprepared sellers has no financial. <laughs> Unfortunately, I see that so often, uh, especially if I do deal, if I'm doing due diligence on um, uh, for 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 a buyer. So unprepared seller, who is it? Has no financial record, has no lease information, has uh, no tax planning, um, and sells too late. And uh, the most uh, and, and the worst sellers, I mean, those that hurt themselves the most is they have bad brokers. They don't involve attorneys. They involve uh, consultants too late. And that's, that's going to hurt them hundreds of thousands of dollars. Um, some of the practices that are difficult to sell are, you know, practices that are too small, that don't practice cash, that don't have cash flows, practices that have too much refunds, too much adjustments, too much write-offs, too low lab deals and supplies because pretty much the buyer assumes that pretty much, uh, uh, you know, work is not good. Newer practices are not easy to sell. Uh, not retiring uh, uh, sellers are not easy to sell. Every time there is some excessive uh, operation, too much cosmetic, too much uh, specialty, too much implant, too much dentical, too much whatever, excessive, except the net is so good and except the buyer is able to reproduce what's going on, uh, very difficult. Excess marketing, these practices don't sell easily. The practices with newer members, very difficult to sell. Uh, and also practices where pretty much the patient base is coming from, you know, uh, farther than five, five miles, uh, also not easy, easy to sell. Practices that, you know, don't sell within three, four, five months, the seller is in trouble. Also decreasing nets, decreasing cash flow, decreasing revenues. Nobody likes to see that. Okay. So, uh, Actually, Gene talked about all of this stuff. The only thing I want to talk about right now is employee handbook. So you want to make sure as a seller that you have an employee handbook, that you have some policies, that you, have, that you, that you can show the buyer that you're on top of your business. Because if you cannot show you're on top of your business, so chaos, so very difficult. Uh, some closing options these days, so what I have seen is uh, pretty much uh, some of the sellers were able to close at asking price. Some of the buyers have a significant reduction, sometimes with cause, sometimes without cause. I've seen more sellers do work back. I've seen more sellers carry a note and hold back is becoming a little bit more popular these days. It means we pay 80% now, 20% in a year or two if we hit certain limits, but it, different from case from you know it's different just just i just want to let you know that that those bankers that i talked to they want the sellers have a little bit more liability we did talk about that except one point i didn't talk about deferred sale that was very interesting one thing that i've seen that specifically because of uh, COVID, you know we we agreed with a buyer that he that she comes on board with my seller and pretty much that what we do is uh, that she buys in a year about, you know, when everything improves and she's going to be helping that everything is uh, be, uh, be back. Okay. Uh, how can we, I mean, what is the right way to buy, sell these days? Primarily honesty. As if you're a buyer, don't try to lowball. If you're a seller, you know, uh, you have to be a little bit more flexible. These days, as a seller, you have to be careful with predatory buyers and brokers. So they just, you know, we don't want to go with anyone that offers something. And just know, even if you have a signed letter of intent, the buyer might do the due diligence, come back and ask for price renegotiation for or with, or, 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 or with no cost. So we need to know our, our we need to stay on, stand our ground sometimes because, and, and we need to have, again, it goes back to vetting a buyer. We don't want to sell to a serial buyer because what they do is they're wasting sellers' time. And you know, and I know how to recognize some of these people. So flexibility, creativity, mutual respect, very important. These days, every seller, so I would, you know, again, my wife is a practice owner. So the protection of the goodwill, that's very, very important these days. Planning, due diligence, uh, make sure that the right fundamentals are there. 
and also uh, uh, maximizing the value of the practice is going to help you maximize the price of the practice. Good. A few other things that some sellers are considering. So are we going to sell now? Are we going to sell until, are we going to wait until 2020, 21? So what are, you know, these are things we just don't know. There are too many things we don't know. Every sale is different. So, but you know, with more time, we're going to have a little bit more data. We're going to know how everybody's reacting to uh, this uh, COVID. And also just know that some of the buyers, it's very difficult for them because they have no PPP. They have no EIDL, they have no HHS uh, um, uh, grants, they, have, they don't know how to run business. So it's not going to be very easy for some of them as well. So that's my final, final um, uh, slide. So again, I provide everybody with an initial consult. I assist people with reviewing an office, uh, starting buying and selling. We do a financial analysis. Also, we are just tax accounting and consulting firm. And email me if you're a seller. I'm going to provide you with a sample practice profile so you can start do some work on your practice. So I'm going to stop share. Exactly an hour, June. Wow. Okay. Well, do we have any questions? I did not even... The, okay, no Q and A's. I think Jean took care of them. Yeah, a couple uh, of them. They, they were kind of benign, not specific to either one of us really, but okay. some comments on insurances and yeah. Okay, Robert. Thank you for your for your. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, thank you Artin. Out. Thank you. Thank you, Howard. Oh, Howard, great. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jean. Thank you, Howard. Everybody, thank you. That was yeah, a great thanks, day. Yeah, thanks, everyone. Have a great weekend. Have a great weekend. Take care. Thanks. Oh, have Fizel, a good there, was, yes, there was one question. Are you going to be posting this? Are you sending this to me to post on YouTube? And then are you yes, one person I'll do both. about the slides? Yes. First of all, we are live on uh, Facebook. So everybody can go back to Facebook and watch it. Uh, just just run me, uh, Fazel Mastashari. Uh, CPA, that's there, number one. Number two, once this is processed by Zoom, uh, I'm going to post a link, and uh, I am also going to email a copy to Jean. So Jean is going to post it on YouTube as well. Great. Great. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Have a great weekend. Thanks, everyone. Bye Take care. Bye. Bye for now. Bye, Jean. Bye-bye. Have a great weekend.